Hi, welcome to MediatorPodcast.com, a podcast and video series about mediation, negotiation, and collaboration. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I'm a valuation expert and financial mediator in St. Louis, Missouri. I specialize in divorce and partnership disputes, but today we're actually going to be speaking about an issue that we see in divorce with Victoria McCooey. We're going to talk about divorce and narcissism and really like lessons from a narcissist divorce coach and how to reclaim your life back. Now, I really am interested in you understanding and listening to Victoria because she is a narcissist divorce coach. She's also a motivational speaker, and she created a system called Reclaim Your Power. She's based in New York, but she services clients around the world, and she's really helping people not only in the divorce process, but anytime you're in a relationship with a narcissist. And I think we throw those terms around a lot, Victoria. So welcome to this podcast, because it's going to be an interesting one, right? (laughs) Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I can't wait. Oh my gosh. So one of the things that I know is like before I got into divorce, I would throw around the term narcissism. I was like, oh my gosh, you're a narcissist. Like anytime somebody was selfish or self-centered, everybody would use that term. Now, when I got into the divorce like world, I started to realize like there were, this was actually like a psychological thing. Like this was actually a diagnosis. Like this has more layers to it. And then it has implications in relationships. So I think like just even to start off, I I think let's go back to where I was and I didn't understand the differences. So when we're in a relationship and it's going bad, like a divorce, everybody seems like they're amping up, right? So how do I know if my spouse is like really a narcissist or are they just selfish or self-centered or like, what's the difference? Well, I'll tell you the difference, but first of all, does it matter? I mean, if, if the relationship is toxic, then it doesn't matter if you can put that label on the person or not, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's about your boundaries, what you can to- will tolerate, where, where your boundary is for that kind of treatment. So- the real answer to your question is that a psychiatrist has to diagnose someone as a narcissist. And it's not easy. You know, there it's there's a lot of gray area. There are nine traits. And if they can check five of the nine boxes, they can diagnose them as a narcissist. But first of all, we're all on the spectrum, right? It's healthy to have a little dose of self-esteem and confidence and ego, right? We need a little bit of that. But where on the spectrum are you? So maybe someone has the traits and whether they can be diagnosed or not, does it really matter? Because if those traits are toxic to you or unhealthy for you, then it's it's not a good relationship for you. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that sometimes what we're seeing is, you know, did did the uh, negative behavior or behavior escalate, right? Because when we're in a divorce or when a relationship is breaking down, everything is kind of, you know, more, um, more flagrant, right? So you're doing things to be harmful to each other. But if we dial it back, like, what are some of the early warning signs of narcissism in an individual? Like, if, if we're getting in relationships, like, where do you see this kind of personality trait appear? Right. So the first thing that typically we see is a kind of gaslighting or brainwashing that happens. So the very typical scenario is, let's say the man is the narcissist because most narcissists are men. Uh, and the female in the relationship is a really, uh, caring, empathetic, um, you know, I say they're list makers, they're high achievers, they're rule followers, they're the good girl, right? They, uh, are conscientious, you know, those are the types of people that narcissists tend to target. And when I say narcissist, I don't know if they're diagnosable, they're way 
over on the spectrum of narcissistic traits, right? So they see the potential of having that person easily brainwashed because of their personality. So what the narcissist tries to do out of the gate is convince you to believe their narrative of what is reality. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not, sometimes it's really far-fetched. I, I was just telling the story yesterday in a, on a webinar I did about the first time I remember in my relationship, a gaslighting event that I didn't recognize at the, at the time, of course, as gaslighting, but it was when my then boyfriend, who I ended up being my husband, but we were only just dating for a few months, um, told me to meet him at a very big intersection. And, you know, it's a long time ago, so there are no cell phones and there's no GPS. And it was this huge intersection in Queens, New York, that I'd never been to before. He said, I'll pick you up, meet me at this time on the northwest corner of this huge intersection. So I'm a nervous wreck thinking that I have to get this right. Um, and so I figure out I, which one is the Northwest corner. I get there early, everything. And then when he doesn't show up on time, I immediately, I'm already programmed to think it's going to be my fault, right? Mm -hmm. I'm already a nervous wreck. And this is, I'm the typical victim of narcissistic abuse. So I'm like every other woman who's in these relationships. It's like, we're so conscientious. Like, did I do something wrong? I must be the problem here. I must have. How can I fix this, right? So 45 minutes go by and I'm like, okay, if I have it wrong, it must be me. And I think where else, I start wandering around this huge, and finally I find him parked way away, catty corner to where I was. And I get in the car and he goes, what took you so long? And I go, well, I was on the Northwest corner. And he said, well, didn't you see a police car there? You, you must have seen the police car. I'm like, I don't remember. He goes, well, anyone would have realized that I couldn't go there because my registration is expired and there was a police car there. So any normal person would have realized I'd be at the other farthest away point. And I thought because low self-esteem or, you know, not enough confidence or whatever the childhood traumas <laughs> created in me going, oh, I'm wrong. I'm at fault. Mm -hmm. So this is how they groom you into, they, they plant these seeds of you not being enough, you not being smart enough or pretty enough or, or uh, talented enough or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. To diminish your self-esteem. Well, and I think that one of the interesting pieces that you said is the good girl, is the rule follower, because I think that what we see in divorce is that the narcissist will tell you a reality that they believe, like they've gaslit themselves as well, right? Yeah. But they will then kind of portray that reality as, and, and they're convincing and they're easy, you know, like all of these things. But the target is that they, a narcissist won't follow the rules, right? The narcissist creates the rules that they want to follow, but they are with somebody that's following the rules, which is like fascinating to yes, me. Yes, yes. And you better follow the rules. They're very uh, upset if you don't, but the rules don't apply to them mm -hmm. because they're entitled. Mm -hmm. They're the grandiosity that they feel, you know, they're above the law. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll park in the no parking space, but nobody else better do it. Right, right. right. Okay. So, and, and we're kind of, we're, I think that this kind of flows next. So we talked about a couple of things and we'll, we'll go back to like what the, the narcissist traits are as well, but like, let's talk more about the types of people that, that these narcissists are targeting, because yeah. this was a very big piece that you talked to about when we were even discussing this topic. And it was interesting because one thing that you said was that when narcissists get divorced, they will sometimes hire narcissistic attorneys or professionals. But like, are is are they targeting those types of people because they can control them? Or like, what's the psychology there? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think they're just, uh, they're so enamored of themselves, right? They're so in love with themselves that they see themselves in this other person. And they hold that in very high esteem. Um, 
they they want someone who says things that that trigger them in a good way, like, oh yeah, we're gonna annihilate them, we're gonna get everything, they all get nothing, you know, that it feeds their ego and what they expect. Wow. Like a normal attorney would say, well, here's what's fair, here's what the law says, this is what you can hope for. But a narcissistic attorney is gonna be, you know, flamboyant and thinking, promising the world, you know, it'll be very different. Mm. Okay. This is like, this is what make it a little bit of sense. So I know you've covered, like, it doesn't, you know, so a lot of my clients will come and say, well, I talked to my therapist and my therapist says that that person, my spouse is absolutely a narcissist, right? No, no cognitive meeting, but right. right? So I have traditionally kind of tried to understand it that most people have like, you can have narcissistic tendencies or traits, but to really get the diagnosis, like, is it even necessary to get the diagnosis? Why? I, I That's think, what I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> well, and one of the things that I thought was different that somebody told me that really made a difference to me is that a true narcissist is going to want to have pain upon you. Like they're going to want this to like, see you suffer in some, whereas like, if I'm just being selfish and I like accidentally take your stuff, I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take your stuff. Whereas a narcissist would be like, what? Like they don't even not like you don't exist in their purview at all. Right. Well, here's why they want to hurt you. Okay. Okay. So their biggest fear is the fear of abandonment. This is something, and you know, there are stories about if something happened in their, their adolescence, uh, where one parent or parental figure abandoned them, either physically abandoned them or emotionally abandoned or something. And the other parental figure overcompensated. They have this kind of splitting thing going on, whatever. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but how that manifests later is that this fear of abandonment comes out when someone leaves them, you know, in a relationship or a divorce. Now, their worst nightmare is coming true. This is the thing they have feared the most their whole lives. And you're, you're the reason you're doing that to them. You're inflicting that pain, that, that narcissistic injury on them. You have to be punished mm -hmm. for that. They have to hurt you as much as they think you've hurt them. So it's disproportionate to us, right? Mm -hmm. This is the biggest injury you can do for in their mind. And so they have to retaliate. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like if they if their fear is of abandonment and they are constantly fearing the abandonment, then they exert the control and the control either comes over money, your body, uh, where you are, your location. So it becomes an entire controlling because if they can control you, Children. everything. Yeah. And manipulate the children as well. But if they can control you, then they, in their mind, they're safe that you can't leave. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. And the, the real thing that blows our minds when we're going through this is that they will be begging you to stay, telling you everything you need to hear that I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Everything's, you know, you have to come back or you'll ruin everything or whatever. And at the same time, they're doing these horrible things to you financially or with the kids or like whatever. And it's like, well, which is it? Do you want me to come back? Or you, like, why would you do these things that push me away if you're begging me to come back? It makes no sense to us, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I call this the scotch tape effect because, you know, when you take scotch tape and it can go in two different directions, they're going in two different directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we're like, we don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, because they're doing this at the same time. They're saying like, I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll do something. They're also saying you're horrible and worthless and you're never going to find anybody. And you're lucky that I was even there. And right. I, I think that the, what, when I see is the intersection of narcissism, power control and money. And if you can keep the money over somebody's head, then you def like if you can't afford to get divorced, if you don't know where the money is, then like literally they've captive, they have you captive under finance. And, and reality is like, 
a lot of this is all abuse, emotional abuse, financial verbal abuse. abuse, financial abuse. Like, is that typically tied to a narcissist? A hundred percent. hundred percent. hundred percent. Like yeah. that's how they, like, if you start to see as an outsider, this start to take a, almost like, is that abusive? <laughs> like I have currently narcissists using the system to abuse them. And everybody's just like sitting around and ignoring it. Right. And the, the really frustrating part is that somehow, and I see it in every case, including mine and every case I've worked on with clients, the court system gives them so much leeway. Yeah. You know, the, it's so blatant. It seems like when the the victim, I'm just going to, you know, the, the party that's being victimized by the narcissist does one little thing and the court attacks, right? But the narcissist gets away with murder. It, mm -hmm. I don't understand it. Is it the, they're charismatic? Is it like they're so volatile? The court's afraid that, you know, they'll explode or cause, uh, you know, write letters or just try to disbar people. I mean, they've done all, they do all that. So yeah. I think no, they're petrified. It's not getting, and, and I think that coercive control is a, is a big issue, right? You know, like this type of situation is going blatant around the country in courts all over the world that are, are basically, it's a double standard, right? And so the narcissist is going to not obey the rules and charm themselves out through it. And the rule follower, the spouse is going to be like, well, that's not, that's not the rule. And I'm going to pay, but, and they get kind of screwed. Yeah. Now, we we do want to talk about because I think what we want to kind of talk about is like how you kind of your story, but also let's establish that a lot of times we're going to see narcissism and divorce go hand in hand in some capacity, especially if you get higher dollar, right? If you guys all got married out of school and you didn't have any money and it, they were a narcissist and then you got money and they're a narcissist, like you're going to ex it's going to exponentially go further. But I also need people to understand like the, the court is like, you think because you follow the rules that the court is going to protect you. Like I literally have a client that's receiving verbal abuse through the court, like through email communications that all the court judge, everybody can see. And they sat there and they said, how has the court been allowing this to happen for six months? Like I have to see this communication for the kids yet. Why is the court like every day? Why is the court allowing me to get abused? And I was like, well, I don't know the answer, but what we want to do today is start to say, okay, can you be in control of the solution? Can you start a different kind of way about this? And, and I, because I do so much divorce and I see so much financial abuse, like I want to start getting people to know how to be proactive, right? You're going to have to take control of this and you can't rely on a judge, an attorney or anybody to protect you. Like I have people that want orders of protection and, and the courts are like, no, because, you know, like we got to get through this divorce. Maybe you'll get an order. Like, are you kidding me? Like that, like obviously very dangerous stuff. Like I have heightened security at my office because of the situations that we have. So when somebody is considering getting divorced to somebody that they think is on this narcissism spectrum, you know, what are some of the things that they have to consider to be safe and to make some of the right decisions? All right. So it's all about communication, right? Okay. So I've identified that there are three phases of divorcing a narcissist, right? There's the phase where you are trying to figure out how to get out and you are gathering information, you're hiring lawyers, you're you're trying to get your ducks in a row, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the phase when you're actually in a divorce, in litigation, and there's a court involved and there are lawyers and you're probably on a parenting app and you know, you're know you under a microscope. Everybody's watching everything you do. And then there's the post-divorce rest of your life part. The communication style is different for each one of those, right? So in the beginning, when you're just getting your, they don't know, that you're seriously trying to do exit, you 
have to try to heal while you're still in this abusive relationship, right? Living under the same roof, probably. So I call it the Stepford wife stage, right? You don't want to engage in circular arguments that just wear you down, uh, the abuse. You, you have to put up a shield, but you don't want to let the narcissist know that you're changing, right? You don't want to give them a heads up. So you pretend like you're still status quo, but you're not letting it in. You have to just become an actor and not let the abuse in. Find ways, use tools, tricks, whatever. You know, we come up with some methodology in, in my coaching to keep you from letting in the abuse, uh, not engaging in the arguing, um, but without letting the narcissist know that you're on a mission. Mm -hmm. So that's one stage. The next stage, you're under a microscope. People are looking at all of your Our Family Wizard <laughs> messages or whatever. You don't want to look like the problem. So you have to, you know, I didn't coin this term. Uh, Tina Swithin, I think, did uh, yellow rock. Instead of gray rock, where you don't speak at all or give any emotion, yellow rock is when you have to say little pleasantries. So it looks like you're not being the problem, you know, a, a bitch. You have to say, oh, good morning. Johnny has his uh, photo day at school today. So please, blah, blah, blah. Hope you have a great day. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So everybody sees you're mature and reasonable and responsible and capable of co-parenting with this person who you're really not because it takes two people to co-parent. Mm -hmm. So let them be the aggressor in all the emails and be nasty and you just be oh, I'm so happy that you got to see the kids today, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then the final part, when all eyes are off you, custody is is done, you got your order signed and you're having to co-parent with this person, now you gray, you only information that they absolutely need, not one adjective, <laughs> no, nothing, just T-ball, 5 p.m., that's it right? And no information that's not ordered to be shared. So you recommend go to not the pleasantries, just go. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. in this, so you have like a whole system that like the trajectory of divorcing a narcissist, like, should we start like, is the first step the disruption? Or is it changing your life? Is it? Well, because I feel like you need like, I don't like, I don't know what's the chicken or the egg, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the disruption is internal. Oh, okay. Can we talk about that a little yeah. bit? Because it's very hard for me to have some of these discussions when they're like deep in the divorce. And I'm like, you need to change yourself. And you really have to like, check your ego. And they're like, but they've been doing this for so many years. And I'm like, oh, okay. Look, confronting a narcissist that is saying, I've had it. It's done. I'm not taking this anymore. They're just going to amp it up. Right. I mean, that's not good. They have worked so long and so hard to get you in this place. They are not going to let you undo it. Right. They're going to do it, it, it. They will double down on the abuse to get you to say, oh my God, this is too, too much, too big, too scary, too, I'm not doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to come to a place and, you know, people go, well, how do, how do I get, I always say, when you know that whatever lies on the other side of this has got to be better than your life today, like what you're living now, that's when, you know, there's no fear. There's no more fear mm -hmm. because you know, you can't stay where you are. Mm -hmm. Anything would be better than this. So, right. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I think, you know, in this, and you kind of move into it is how do you start changing how you are? And it, it, it does have to, because one of the key things that we talked about in a narcissist is that they will constantly, um, choose to make big deals about things that are unimportant and like not even relevant and they will get you to engage. You were talking about that circular discussion. They will get you to engage in this, like, no, the toilet paper is really cottonelle and not whatever. And you're like, 
who cares? But the, the, the engagement, like a narcissist will literally make you argue about nothing in order to engage that like conflict or something. Yeah. And so you're, I'm but sorry. what is the psychology of the, 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 the spouse that makes them accept that? I think because we're rational people and when you get into an argument, you're trying to get from point A to point B, right? You're trying to get to a resolution, even if it's just say, let's agree to disagree, whatever. You're you're saying, here's my view, here's my here are my points to make my evidence, here are yours. Okay, now if I can't get you to agree with me and you can't get me to agree with you, we're gonna agree to disagree. You can never get there with a right. narcissist, they have to win. So you're in this circular crazy argument and they're bringing in things that have nothing to do with what you're talking about, right? Well, when you, you know, well, five years ago when you did blah, 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 and you're just like, what? And so you're like trying to connect the dots that don't connect. And then finally you're like, okay, I have a life to live. I'm going to walk away from this because this is never going to end. And then they're like, oh, well, you're, you're leaving, you're quitting. You, you, so I win, I win because you're not, you can't argue with that. So mm -hmm. you're, you're stepping out away. So now I win just to try to engage you again. It's exhausting. Is there um, even ever a right time to <laughs> like confront or deal with a, you know, like I'm so unhappy, like, how do I go from, because they'll just be like, oh, you, you, we'll just keep you like a caged bird. Like you'll just go to this apartment and, and I'll still pay for everything. And you'll still be my, like, almost like my possession in some capacity. They'll make it so miserable. Like if you say, I think I want to get divorced, they'll make it so miserable that you will be like a caged bird and they'll be perfectly content with that. Right. Like, the, here's the perfect divorce from a narcissist, right? If I could go back, okay, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see mine. It would be I would make that decision. I would get all my ducks in a row. I would hire the attorney, the right attorney, and I would then have uh, a a place to go to the day that he served, and I would never speak to him again. I would let everything go through lawyers because there is absolutely nothing to gain by having a conversation after that. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will all be a manipulation to either hurt you or try to get you back in. So there is nothing to gain. And the reality is that that is probably really amazing advice, but you are, I think that typically the spouse is not strong enough, like from an emotional standpoint, from a, a self-esteem, like, this gaslighting has gone on for so long that they are literally like a child in the corner and don't think that they're capable to stand up to this monster ogre. I know. I know. That's why. Like they would be like, how could I never talk to them again? But my children, but my this, but my that. Right. You know, the technology is very different today than it was when I was going through this. So there is no way I could have not talked. You can though now. You can not ever speak to them. True. Um, yeah. So it's so you easy. can still communicate via text, but not to have those physical conversations or discussions. OK, I think that is that is I mean, you, you kind of do have to block them because everything that they're doing and I'm going to be very obtuse with this, but everything that they're going to do is going to be like, hey, in the you know, like the entire time, like the entire time, like. Hey, no, look, 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 you know, and yep. if they can get your attention, I was like, I've tried to tell people like the more you engage and they think that they're participating, I said the, the easiest way like, okay, no, no. Okay. Yes. yes no. Um, yeah. Information okay. only. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's hard. But here, here's the really the saddest part is that these victims after years and years of narcissistic abuse are so compromised like a shell of a person, right? They're not their real selves. They're like this really compromised version of themselves. They don't present well. Mm -hmm. They're they're timid or anxious or uh, high strung or, you know, all these things from the abuse. And this is when they have to present to a custody evaluator mm -hmm. or, you know, a forensic psychologist or a parenting coordinator. Like, 
they're not coming off as their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. So, well, and those are the things that the, the, the narcissist is going to do. They're going to ask for a psychological evaluation of you because you're the problem. You know, they're, they're going to do some of these tactics in court in order to make you kind of manipulated and, and controlled. Now, one of the things that you talked about, because I have another kind of thing that we, we might want to address too, but like in this process, the one thing that you can do, I think at any point, whether you are still actively in, like even more so if you are actively in a situation like this, your only thing that you can control is how you become this different version of yourself. The stronger you become, I think the more capable you are of going through this battle, which is really what you're endeavoring to do. Mm -hmm. And you can get, you know, like, how are you recommending people do this? Because again, I'm saying at any stage, you've said you want to get divorced. You're just thinking it. You're like, I'm going to be done with this. Whatever stage you are, you have to start focusing on yourself. And what what are you telling them? Because they're like, but, but, you know, like, it's going to be excuses. Like, but I, but I, I can't, I have to focus on this. And yeah, and that's, that's why I say it's, you've got to get to that point where this is your focus. This is your priority is nothing can be this bad. I have to do this. So that's your motivation. Um, I, there are four areas, right? Physic, you have to get to be your best physical self, your best emotional self, your best uh, spiritual self, and your best financial self. Mm -hmm. Those are the areas I work on with my clients. Um, yeah, we, we look at your, what you're eating, how you're exercising, how much sleep you're getting. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm not a diet coach, but that's part of being your best self. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're an athlete in training. You're, yeah. you're training for a marathon. It is going to be a long, hard road and you need to be in the best shape possible. You know, yeah. we, we talk about meditating. We talk about rituals. We talk, you know, making uh, yourself a priority, taking care of yourself, uh, getting a, a side hustle or, or finding ways to stash cash, getting your financial support in order. Um, what didn't I mention? Uh, yeah, I mentioned all of them. So spiritually, emotionally, physically, mm -hmm. and financially. And and we use the same terms. We call it a marathon. We call it like climbing a Mount Kilimanjaro. Like this is like, you can't just decide like tomorrow you're gonna go run a marathon. Right. You will probably not succeed, right? But in, in looking at what that would take or, or becoming this sort of strongest version of yourself, what's going to happen is the narcissist is going to notice. Yes. And when they notice and when you become stronger, the next pawns in this game is your children. And what have you seen as, you know, like any, I, I don't know if I have recommendations, you know, when they're using the children as pawns to get to you because you've become strong enough to, to separate from that emotionally and such, like, yes. what do you do with that? I know they will, they will always turn to the children. They will always use the children as pawns. It's just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I tell my clients is that you, you can't control the narcissist, right? Mm -hmm. Courts don't always intervene um you can you can try and you should try to call out what's going on but you know i don't know how much re relief you're going to get that way um but you you have to create contrast for your children so mm. the narcissist is going to use them is going to lie to them is going to tell them things they they don't shouldn't be hearing like all this stuff and you have to be the the parent they can count on you can't undo what, what, say, dad is doing, but you can become the place where they feel safe, that they are not feeling manipulated, even if they don't recognize it. That's that. They know something doesn't feel good, right? Mm -hmm. Dad's saying bad things about mom. Dad's telling me to do things I don't want to do. Like, whatever it is, when they go to moms, we don't talk about dad. We don't talk about the divorce. We are 
happy, we're uplifted. We, I always say the best thing you can do when you're now in a separate household um, and your children are with you, create new rituals mm. that are just unique to your new household. Mm -hmm. And that will make them feel safe at any age. I don't care if they're teenagers. Rituals. Mm -hmm. We always have tacos on Friday night. Like, mm -hmm. I, it doesn't matter. Anything. Right. Um, that's what we count on. Now, when they start feeling like uh, something bad is going on at dad's, who are they going to turn to, right? Mm -hmm. They feel safe with you. They feel safe telling you, coming to you, because you don't talk about it, about mm -hmm. them, right? You're in their corner. Mm -hmm. And whatever level of abuse that you're experiencing as the parent, they are experiencing as the children. So they, creating, they this, right? creating a safe environment, creating an environment that they can like actually see like, oh, wow, I'm not in fear of something happening. Um, I'm not getting I think grilled every time, like even my adult children tell me now what it was like to go to dad's for a weekend mm. because they said from the minute we would get in the car until the minute he dropped us off. It was just grilling us or saying horrible things about you or just that was their life with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, you know, why would they want to be part of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as difficult as it is, you know, like you, you can't change the relationship with them and their parents, you know, the other co-parent. But you can certainly, I, I really like the advice of like providing kind of a dichotomy. A, I know that that's what you experience over there and I'm going to protect you as much as I can. And, you know, and you should use the court system or guardian ad litems or, you know, something in the system to try to help that. But also what, what we have done in negotiation is, you know, trying to, to, basically use the facts that the court will acknowledge and in the situation to try to basically force the narcissist to have to pay attention to the laws. Right. And it's not always, it, it's like most of the time something gets settled at the end and, and the, and the person, the out spouse, the victim always feels like they got away with it. Like, and you're not going to feel like the, the court comes in and slaps them or anything in that kind of situation. So you're going to have to, to, you know, and part of this that I think is kind of interesting, it's like, okay, I'm in this situation. I'm going to have to get out. I now understand that I'm going to need some help from all of the, you know, like even we're sitting here, like we can't totally help you. Like you're going to have to fight this fight to get through it. But then you might have to internally look like if this is the type of person that you also are attracted to or have had a pattern with, like, how can you start to see maybe what you could do internally? And that's part of this whole internal monologue, right? Like, okay, what, why did I pick that person? Right? Well, okay. So everyone asks me how I want to be able to recognize narcissists. So see the red flag so I can go the other way. And I go, you got it totally backwards. It's not about recognizing them. It's about working on yourself to the point where they, you repel narcissists. Mm. They don't want anything to do with you because you're too strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. When you have great self-esteem and lots of confidence and, uh, feel complete they're they can't do what they they can't manipulate you mm -hmm. so they're uninterested mm -hmm. yeah i've also found that one effective way to deal with narcissist or one way is that you have to have public embarrassment and so if you're going to deal with a narcissist like like you kind of said like don't have the communication, but if you're with your attorney and they're with their attorney, the narcissist will misbehave with everybody there. They will misbehave. But if they see your interaction with the narcissist and see them kind of escalate, because the more you calm, the more the na narcissist will escalate. The more they can see that they're not affecting you, the more they're going to escalate. And it's really allowing that 
in the light or even like I try to take it one step further and blatantly ignore them. Like if they say, well, this is the truth, I'll be like, factually, that's incorrect. And here's a document that shows that that's not right. And then that's also not right. So probably everything that you've said is incorrect. And once you take that from them, which is ego, attacking ego, then they're going to be like, oh, and then if I'm right, they're going to be like, oh, how did, because how, how, they're not used to somebody, do, like usually I see narcissists in positions of power and money, they've surrounded themselves with yes people. And so nobody's telling them no. And that is one effective way to handle it in this situation, but not if you're the party, not if you're the spouse. Like, right. So, that's going to potentially ex escalate the abuse, right? Right, right. So what, it's been my experience when you have a narcissist in that scenario and you say, well, here's a document that proves that that's false. They will tell you your document is false. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're never going to be right. No, you're, you're never, never going to be, be right. smarter than, than them or righter than them. But you have to start to acknowledge. So in some capacity, I think if you're negotiating in this, you know, we go back to the what are you in control of? yourself, your responses, the way you show up consistently in court and hearings and communications and everything. It's the same. And, and not like, Oh, poor me, but just like, this is what's happening. Like I've been trying to tell you guys, I, I think if some of that, you can take control of your narrative, your story, how you show up, then you can see what is the reality of the financial situation. You know, like I have people all the time that their spouse will be like, you're going to get nothing. And I was like, okay, but, but if your lawyer and your financial person have told you that that's not true, that you're going to be okay. And they can't almost, they can't even get their mind out of, but he said, I'm going to be on the streets, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you combat that? Because that's brainwashing. That's like, Yes. That's the, the, the gaslighting, right? Okay, so here's the metaphor I use okay. for my clients. I tell them that the narcissist has put up this carnival mirror for you. Like it's a distorted mirror. It makes like, if you're skinny, you look fat or like, you know, one of those kind of mirrors. So you're seeing what, what they're holding up for you and you become addicted. Like you can't break out of this mirror. Like you see what they tell you to see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we talk about shattering the carnival mirror, like shatter it. Like you need a real mirror, like real people who are not incentivized to just make you believe something false, like who are going to tell you the truth, believe the real mirror mm -hmm. of what you see. So yeah, I tell people all the time. Oh, and I was a victim of it too. You'll never get a penny. I'm um, taking the kids away from you. Like, you know, I tell that, yes, of course he says that because he wants to scare you into not leaving. But there are laws in place that prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, unfortunately, in divorce, we're waiting for a hearing. You know, we're waiting for some sort of relief through the court system, but it can't be immediate. Right. And it can't be like, OK, you're still going to endure that. It's like, how do you block it? How do you stop it from affecting you? How do you stop it from really thinking that it's real? Because it's not real. Like what they're saying is not real. You know, get a coach. <laughs> what can, I, you know, that's where the support comes in. And in I even think place. the attorney may not be the first step, right? If you can get a coach, if you can get somebody, I even say get the financial person, you know, like understand your money, understand yourself and then get safe and have a plan, right? So it might be at first, and a coach could be a rational starting point that's not gonna break the bank. You can find the money, you can go to the store, get some cash out, do it for a couple of weeks, go meet with the coach and say, okay, what? Because what we know, and I'm not a coach, but I'm the financial person, but what you and I know is a more direct way to go down this path and get prepared for the marathon and right. that will save them the emotional trauma. It's right. not going to save them time and money because time and money is going to take 
this narcissist is going to fight you. You need to get emotionally safe, right? Yes. And as long as we're talking about the money piece, Whatever you invest in a coach is going to, uh, you're going to save that in legal fees times 10 because you're not going to be going to a $400 an hour attorney every time you feel worried or, or upset or he said this or this happened or, right? There's only so much the attorney can do in that front. It's not a legal question. It's right. an emotional question. It's like, right. how do I... How do I handle this abuse or how do I block this or what do I do about the kids? Those are questions to work through with your coach. And whatever you invest in a coach, you're going to save multiple times over from not going to the attorney with those things. And, and typically, if you're going to get divorced, you're going to hire an attorney, you're going to hire a financial expert. And guess what we don't want to listen to? right? The emotional. Is the emotional. And I'm telling you, attorneys get even snarky with it. Like go talk to your therapist about this. Like you're wasting all of our time. But the reality is there's so much strategy in how to deal with this and effectively, because some of it's settle, trying to settle it. So we don't have to go to court. You know, there's so much strategy in that, that I tell people ask the right questions to the right expert. So if you have a legal question, that's for your lawyer. If you have a financial question, that's for your financial expert. But if you have an emotional question, that is not for a therapist, okay? This is this is very specific, nuanced stuff. <laughs> and when you're talking high dollars and narcissism and abuse and divorce and all of this, a traditional therapist could certainly be beneficial but they're not going to help you traverse this marathon or climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, right? Well, you know what the difference between therapy and coaching is? Um, therapy is very effective for unpacking your childhood traumas, for understanding why you find yourself repeating patterns, how you can heal and do better going forward. But coaching is about getting from point A to point B. It's like, okay, here I am. I need to get out of this marriage. Like, how do I get to the other side of this? Like, so coaching is never looking back at why you do the things you do. We're just focused ahead. So there's this um, story. If you show up at the therapist's office with a suitcase, the therapist will unpack it and figure out why you put those things in there. And if you show up to the coach's office with a suitcase, the coach will say, where do you want to go? And how are you going to get there? Oh, okay. Okay. I like that. I like that. Oh, that's good. Okay. So if somebody um, like has been watching this and they're like, okay, so it doesn't matter if we've diagnosed my, my spouse, I know hands down they're a narcissist, right? Because most people have done their Google searches and right. they've been like, oh yeah, I can check all these boxes. Yep. I think they are. But if they're in that position, and again, I we're almost not even saying like all divorce coaches are the same. Like this is, I'm just saying like, this is a very nuanced, like it is so divorcing a narcissist affects your divorce so much at such deep levels. And like, usually they make things last a lot longer. Like we're most of our divorces that involve a narcissist will be two years, three years. Like that's insane. Mine was, mine was six and I have clients who are on their fourth, fifth or sixth year. Oh my gosh. So like, this is what she's saying when like, we're not saving you money. We're trying to shortcut how they're going to bastardize the system. Right. And so you really need somebody that understands that even if the financial, if they don't understand the financial abusive situation, that's not the right one. Like right. these are, these are, we're playing big leagues here. Right. And they came to win and they are going to play dirty. So we got to be prepared. So if they reach out to you, what is your, can you tell us a little bit more about like you, I think you've given us a couple nuggets in this, uh, <laughs> in this little uh, uh, podcast, but can you tell us more about like how somebody could reach you? Like what your process is, maybe a program or, or how could they do this? Yeah. 
Well, um, the first step is to book a call with me. I call it a breakthrough to break free call. Okay. And uh, so you can go to my website for that. Um, I think there will also be a link here to book a call. So once we have that initial call, we're going to figure out what your best next step is, like where you are in this process and what your next step is. And then if we're a good fit and we decide we want to work together, there are different, there are two different ways I work with clients. I have one-on-one -on -one coaching and I have a group program. Okay. And I'm a big fan of both, but I do, I think that um, if you are unsure, right. Or if you, um, because you also have to figure out like how you're going to I'm not talking like most people will have money to pay for it, but you have to talk like you have to also make sure maybe it's not traceable <laughs> as much so that they, oh, wow, you're working with a divorce coach, but you haven't told anybody that and you might not have access to money. A lot of narcissistic relationships, no, like the one spouse doesn't have any act like they're given a, a stipend or an allowance. Oh, I got to hate that term. I know. Or they have to use a certain card that the narcissist can see. Mm -hmm. So you right. just have to be, my, so that's why talking yeah. to you at the beginning is very important. It is. And even paying, even paying me can be <laughs> dicey. And I can tell you how many, um, most of my clients are using somebody else's credit card, you yeah. know, their, their mother or their sister or their friend or whatever. Correct. Yeah. And so, you know, like talk with her because Again, there are, are there are ways that you might have to go through this process that might break the rules a little bit, but it's okay. Like you need to know what the new narrative is and understand like how much, because you can either play fair and lose or <laughs> it's fine if that's what you want to do, or you can decide that you need to be a little bit more crafty, a little bit more smart and use the law in your favor, right? Use the law to protect you as opposed to just waiting for it to come and save you. Right. No, no, no. Let me tell you, that's part of that, that good girl syndrome that we've all got, right? So we're like, oh, no, no, that might look bad or uh, that that might, might not be good or I can't do that. And I, I go, listen, nobody's going to throw you in jail if you use somebody else's credit card to pay for something like yeah. nobody, this is okay you know that we it's your money too <laughs> it's, it's your money, your too. money too yes <laughs> you know because people are like well he's not giving me any money and i was like you even the narrative around how you talk about this is like it's your house oh no he says it's his because he pays all the bills and he makes no ma'am no ma'am no ma'am so <laughs> <laughs> this is delightful. Um, I and I know that we're gonna. I think that it would be interesting to talk more about like how to negotiate with a narcissist and and more details. But I really wanted to get you on to just kind of help women who are in this situation know that there are some options to get out. The one thing that I was gonna say is that I do love the concept of group um, in this type of environment because then you connect with other people. I also like Victoria that you've gone through this situation. And so like you have some basis with which to say, like, I, I, I know that it's a hard thing to do, but like I did do it and I want to help you understand the things that you're going to experience. And it's unfortunate that we have to do this, but, um, you know, a group situation could also be a great start. To I just love the group because the camaraderie is unbelievable, you know, mm -hmm. and I give them a forum where they can talk to each other outside of the group. Um, I mean, outside of the calls we have and uh, they become very close. They yes. support each other. It's so good to know you're not the only one going through something like and that. And it's confidential. And what you'll find if you haven't found it already is that when you start to talk about divorce, do you think your friends and family are going to want to listen to you for three years, six years talking about the same shit every single day? No, but these people that you connect with that they've gone through, you're at, you're not just talking at each other. You're like, oh, I, I did this and this. Oh, I did this and this helps. And you're actually leveling up each other that I think is very powerful. Absolutely. So, yeah. Amazing. All right, Victoria. Well, I know we'll have you back, but yeah. you do have a lot of options for people to work with you. And I appreciate all the information that you've provided. So I appreciate your invitation to be on your show. Woohoo! So maybe we'll see you again soon, right? I hope so. All right. Thank you.